provide more income for the residents of urban settings. That's a nice <laughs> small task. But, uh, but I'm serious. I mean, if we start to ask the question, how do you get kids to learn more? The answer, one of the answers is, you get their families to have the dignity that comes with work that pays reasonable amounts, so they take better care of their kids. Uh, we have evidence that that's true. Uh, you want an evidence-based uh, uh, notion? Well, um, if you could take a family of four earning about 15000 and over the next few years slowly get their way worked up to 20, 21, 22000 which they're still desperately poor, the effects on their kids will match what Head Start does in three years. Of course, exactly the same. Okay? So um, one of the things we have to do is make sure that people have um, the wherewithal to raise their family well. And it seems to me that if we say what tasks do um, urban leaders, and that's really what I'm going to talk about, urban leaders rather than just urban superintendents or urban principals, um, wh what do they have to do? They um, have to find ways to provide their communities with um, the wherewithal so that they thrive. We have research that says neighborhoods that have a sense of efficacy are neighborhoods where the schools work. And neighborhoods that have a sense of not, or, or don't have a sense of efficacy, where the role models are people in trouble trying to make do with, with some of the uh, vagaries of life, Th those neighborhoods don't have a lot of role models for kids. They don't have a sense of efficacy. And the schools don't change because of that. The schools change because people have a sense of efficacy. And they know how to get things done. And how do you get a sense of efficacy? You have a sense of a future orientation and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, what do you do? Well, it seems to me that the urban leader of the future uh, in a school system uh, has to push for things. It's the chief mechanism of making this school a success is um, the counseling department. Instead of having like one counselor for 800 kids, they have like one counselor for three or 400 kids, and the counselor meets with the kids. Instead of when the kid is bad, the counselor meets with them anyway. <laughs> the counselor sits with them and says, let me see your program, you're going to college. And a couple of times a year, every kid is assessed and it becomes a natural part of the system. They created a culture in which kids go to college. And you know what? They show up and they go to college. It's, it, it's almost not rocket science, but it's not easy to do but they create the culture. And our administrators of the future have to figure out how to get uh, schools like that started, build those kind of cultures. Study groups work in urban areas where people sit and study. Well, you have to have time for them. And again, I would say that's the, uh, uh, you have to find the ways to build seeking time for teachers into a curriculum for leadership. If your candidates are not good enough for your kids or your grandkids, they shouldn't be teaching anybody's kids. You could bring a set of um, uh, a powerful interdisciplinary team of experts to work on these issues together. Now, you are a private university. You are not operating under state mandated missions and so forth. I mean, I know you are, um, you're part of the state and, and uh, you are mindful of that. But you have the opportunity to focus on the mission of bringing the expertise from across your institution to bear on the issues in your community. That is a really rare opportunity, and so I guess I'm saying first you've got to engage the whole of the institution. Because what you're going to become is an advocate focusing on the whole range of needs in the community. It is not the job of the School of Education to solve the health care needs of the community. But there are experts within your university community who can be put to that task. And you should be seen as a USC team dedicated to the needs of your urban community. So in a sense, I'm saying take the lead. Take the, get in the vanguard position of attracting from across the entire community in this institution the resources that will allow you to be well-armed as well as well-informed experts 
uh, and helpers in solving problems. And the, the other idea I'd like to share with you is to, is to encourage you to use the incredible credentials uh, and capacity for research to develop a specific research agenda for this community that focuses, in fact, on learning and address all those conditions that impact learning. I think you should begin by defining what you mean by urban education. Recently, it has become a code word for under-resourced, segregated schools serving black and brown students, those people. But here at USC this afternoon, we don't have time for code words. We want to get right to the heart of the matter. We realize that urban education has to do with human population dis density structural density in a given area. It has to do with the predicted consequences of having populations of individuals of over a thousand people and more living or existing within a square mile of acreage. There will be consequences of that happening. And surrounding density areas of over 500 people per square mile, according to the census block, uh, census data. But urban education is about education of these people who live in these dense urban and inner city areas. It's about the educational practices and the structures present within these dense areas, which are generally conflated by issues of race, socioeconomic status, class, linguistic diversity, and current policy. So it's kind of difficult to uh, disengage uh, the various issues that are involved. Regardless, though, of the loaded nature of the term urban education, USC must uh, determine what they mean by the term. They must then take a stance <coughs> concerning the issues that are involved, and they must decide upon the critical areas that they will focus on, that is, they must decide those areas where they feel that they can have the greatest impact, regardless of the challenges and, let us not forget, the possibilities involved in working in urban communities. In my opinion, the most pressing issues needed in urban education have to do with, number one, rethinking, as I've said, what we mean by urban education, defining that very clearly. Then we must rethink one of the most publicized issues of urban schools, what we refer to as academic underachievement within these areas. And if you were at AERA, you heard the talk by the president, Gloria Ladson Billings, who resituated uh, that issue in terms of the education debt, not educational underachievement but the education debt. Now that was powerful and embracing what the president said will have powerful consequences. And I invite you to get a copy of that presidential address, which will be published soon. But simply put, the most pressing needs in urban education, after we've resituated our thinking, have to do with the poor quality of education, limited resources in urban schools, lack of commitment at the national, state, and local level to affect change, the fact that the stakeholders involved, including the students, teachers, school administrators, and parents, they all lack political and economic capital, and thus there is very little true motivation at the levels of power to make change. We also hear it USC would want to consider the development of urban students' literacy skills, the bedrock of success across curriculum areas. It's critically important, and we need to think about what can we do to help students, not just as readers, but as writers, as thinkers, as speakers, as users of multiple literacies. I'm going to start out by saying I think the um, 
The most pressing needs in urban education are certainly the ones that we all know about, the demographic and social class and economic uh, labor market employment shifts we've seen in our country that have left so many young people and their families in communities like those surrounding USC absolutely with a crumbling uh, infrastructure of social support generally and crumbling urban schools. And that's certainly a very pressing need. But I think that even more pressing is to disrupt the intersection of that crumbling social and educational infrastructure and the political ideology that supports it. Because I think right now we're confronted with this juxtaposition of deteriorating social conditions and political ideology, which allows us to make sense of the horrible conditions we see in cities that, that um, paralyzes us. Millions of people are talking with one another about how they can jointly take action to improve the quality of schooling for all American children. Such a public would be eager to engage with educators in defining high quality schools and ready to hold the system accountable for ensuring that quality and that equity. Uh, we could call it democracy in action. You are the producers of leaders and you're viewed that way. And I, I, I guess I would hope um, that you would look honestly at what you are doing to prepare the leaders who will be able to provide the, the depth of expertise to really move systems forward. I would wonder if you shouldn't explore um, how you mentor the leaders that you produce and to what extent you provide um, forums for them to be mentored and to continue their intellectual growth and to keep alive within them the, the passion for the work of educating the young people who come from poverty, who come from backgrounds that, that just bring so many challenges into the classroom. And to what extent is the mentorship formal? To what extent um, are you, as a school of education, um, providing that, not only at the superintendent level, but to principals and assistant principals? You know, we, we hope that USC is producing the brightest and most capable leaders, okay? I, I want to believe that is true, because I, I think that's true, um, unless you tell me otherwise. But I think that we've got to do more. And there is a crisis in leadership right now. When you look at uh, the pool of applicants that are applying for school districts, and even for the principalship, that pool is not a deep pool. Now, are there people willing to do it? Yes, there are people willing to do it. But to have the kind of leadership that can show the way for our urban schools uh, takes the kind of preparation that you as a school of education can provide and the kind of connections that you can maintain with all of us um, once we're out there. I hope that you really walk the talk of your urban mission and that you're willing when you go into your strategic planning to think about um, you know, what you do that does in fact walk the talk. We have a large immigrant population and the public schools have been educating immigrant children for a long time. I mean, back in the late 1800s, we saw the great flood from Europe. And then, of course, we're very familiar with segregation and poverty from the 60s. We've dealt with these issues before. Are we back there again? The world of urban public education today is amazingly different than what is perceived and understood by the public and many professionals. The issues are acute to improve student performance, not to maintain parts of the system that are broken. Schools, districts are not designed to create jobs, to contain kids, or to promote political ideology. 
Cesar Chavez taught me that. We named the first school after Cesar Chavez in the Coachella Valley in 1990. It was the first school named after him. Now there's a whole bunch of schools named after him. And when we dedicated that school, he came with an entourage of people. And everybody expected he was going to talk about grapes and pesticides and all that. And he said this. He said that the schoolhouse should not be a house of political ideology. But instead, it should teach kids how to read, how to write, and how to compute. What can a private university which has the expertise in research, like the University of Southern California do, to help build such a culture of rigorous thinking that will bring about deep mathematical conceptual understanding for all students. First of all, there's a critical need to demonstrate that such a culture can make a difference for student populations which are at very high risk. And one of the populations which is at very high risk for experiencing further academic failure and dropping out of school now is high school students who have repeatedly failed algebra. The University of Southern California could implement and research a demonstration model with cohorts of urban high school students who have repeatedly failed algebra. This research demonstration model can be shaped in the form of an algebra and physics rigorous mathematical thinking academy. This academy will focus on building deep algebra conceptual understanding and interfacing the algebraic structures emerging from this understanding with scientific inquiry to construct physics under conceptual understanding of big ideas in physics, such as force, acceleration, momentum, inertia, energy. Very, very abstract. Very 